Uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon in rainy weather. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people, and, and as I understand, people from all across southern Ontario, so that's pretty cool. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Susan Giroux. I'm the Associate Dean of Humanities here, and I'm also um, affiliated with the English Department, English and Cultural Studies. So I will be introducing David um, shortly. Uh, I just wanted to say a few things to him introduce you to his, his uh, Uber. Invited to address a forum hosted by the Liberation Committee for Africa in June 1961, James Baldwin opened with the following remarks. Bobby Kennedy recently made me a soul-stirring promise that one day, 30 years if I'm lucky, I can be president too. It never entered the boy's mind, I suppose. It has not entered the country's mind yet that perhaps I wouldn't want to be. And in any case, what really exercises my mind is not this hypothetical day on which some, quote, Negro first will become, quote, the first Negro president. What I'm really curious about is just what kind of country he'll be president of. Kennedy's promise would come to fruition not 30, but 50 years later. And as Baldwin predicted, times are indeed tough for America's first black president, and for the nation more generally. And no one has been more attentive to Baldwin's provocation than this afternoon's speaker, David Theo Goldberg. His recent work has been devoted precisely to historicizing and theorizing the unprecedented damages incurred from nearly four decades of racially driven neoliberal policies that are Barack Obama's inglorious bequest as well as a set of crisis conditions only exacerbated by his complicity with and participation in the national uh, commitment to willful historical amnesia. The colorblinding imperative that has marked the racial politics of the post-civil rights era has effectively preempted individual and collective capacities to understand the connections between the racist exclusions of the past and the contemporary racially prompted transformations of state apparatuses of sovereign power, raison d'etat, and its shift from welfare to warfare. Dr. Goldberg's most recent work, The Threat of Race, carefully composed with his now trademark precision and rigor, draws our attention to a deeply disturbing contemporary paradox among academics, intellectuals, and political pundits across the ideological spectrum, who insist on the irrelevance of race, on the death of race, conceptually speaking, while at the same time racially produced death as a result of war, state violence, crippling poverty, famine, disease, grows exponentially the world over. Against right-wing logics proclaiming the end of racism or insistent calls from some on the left to return to the primacy of race and political economy, the threat of race seeks to unsettle theoretical concepts and modes of analysis that have passed uncritically into the common sense of recent cutting-edge social theory. Indeed, one notes in his most recent text a shift in scholarly tone and analytic vocabulary, a passion and focus born of urgency, yet committed to remaining, in his words, quote, coolly critical, cutting, and incisive. The stark assessment and disturbing terminology he invokes to communicate the global threat of post-racial presumption reflect his judgment of the securitizing logics at work in the US and similar societies he calls self-estrangulating. Societies in pursuit of the illusion of safety and security through power-assisted forms of social homogeneity he characterizes as cloning cultures, born of what he calls the sociality of the skin, which I think is some understood. Uh, that require the disappearance, if not the eradication of enemies, foreign and domestic, inevitably racially indexed. Against the fantasy of post-racial global triumphalism, he compels our witness and our critical response to racially driven suffocation and asphyxiation of industrialized, globalized mass violence in the form of ethno-racial purging, mutilation, genocide, duress, and disposability, capable even of destroying, depriving, evaporating death itself of marginality, segregation, and separation as seen in the warehoused, imprisoned, and camped, the permanently temporary and the rogue, and the horror of non-being, or what he calls racial erasure, racial evaporation, 
or the depersonalization of the damned. Dr. Goldberg's bold yet meticulous analysis points to a number of disturbing questions. How is it that we have arrived at a presence so marked by racial humiliation, terror, and death, as these troubling images and tropes insist? And how have we come to imagine it as our moment of triumph, the achievement of a thoroughly deracinated new world order, conceived variously in rubrics of democ racial democracy, multiculturalism, ethnic pluralism, and colorblindness? And what is our path back from the brink of societal self-destruction? James Baldwin felt the urgency of similar questions in his pitched battle against the long, terrifying history of legal segregation in 1961. Yet he concluded his address to the Liberation Committee with a sense of possibility. We have in this country now, and there's really one minute to 12, can really turn the tide because we have an advantage that Europe doesn't have. And we have an advantage that Africa doesn't have, if we could face it. Black people and white people have lived together for generations and now for centuries. Now, or whether or not, on whether or not we face these facts, everything depends. Against the relentless forms of market-driven segregation, social securitization, and containerization that mark the contemporary moment in North America and internationally, Dr. Goldberg urges another modality of living together based on what he calls heterogeneous dispositions and dispositions of openness, which offer an, what he calls an antidote to the conceit of holding things constant, to the arrogance of control. Such dispositions, he says, require the forsaking of guarantees of outcome, predict, predicted, excuse me, predicated on stability and predictability, and acknowledging the inevitable and shared fact of our mutuality and vulnerability. Americans and Canadians still hold the advantage of their shared history of heterogeneity, if, as Baldwin says, we can face it. David Theo Goldberg is the director of the University of California Humanities Research Institute, which is the University of California's system-wide research facility for the human sciences and theoretical research in the arts. He also holds faculty appointments as professor of comparative literature and criminology, law, and society at UC Irvine and is fellow of the UCI Critical Theory Institute. He is the author of innumerable books, including The Threat of Race, The Racial State, Racial Subjects, Racist Culture, and has edited or co-edited many volumes, including A Companion to Racial and Ethnic Studies, Between Law and Culture, and Relocating Postcolonialism and Critical Race Theories. Please join me in welcoming David Theo Goldberg. Thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I uh, want to thank Henry Drew and Susan Drew for inviting me back. It's my second visit to McMaster in a number of years now. Um, and it's a pleasure to have you all here and uh, have a conversation with you all. Just a quick word about socialities of the skin. The line in Rushdie is the Gravanita feet, which is a really bad novel, probably the worst, but, um, but a fun read. Um, to plow through on the history of rock and roll, basically, um, is uh, life at the frontier of the skin. I mean, that was a line you used, and I kind of turned it into sociality. So, um, so today I want to talk um, uh, a bunch about um, the post-racial and uh, the sort of signifying apparatuses that go along with uh, this uh, recourse to the post-racial. And there's a sense in which, you know, the claim is that we're all post-racial now, right? I mean, this is it, right? And, uh, you know, there are many people who've sort of made this claim. It, it kind of, it, it had circulated before, but became kind of publicly apparent in the wake of Obama's election in the US. And maybe, you know, along with that, uh, sort of certain claims in the likes of South Africa and in Europe and so on and so forth. Um, and the, you know, the critical response has largely been, well, hey, not yet, not so fast, right? So kind of, and then a slew of data, you know, which, with which we're, I mean, generally familiar, right? I mean, in the U.S., for example, right, the uh, family wealth uh, differential between blacks, Latinos on one side and whites on the other went in the past 25 years from 12 to 1 
to 20 to 1 in the case of blacks and to 18 to 1 in the case of whites. I mean, so where's post raciality there, right? Uh, you know, prison populations have gone up largely inhabited by people of color. Uh, uh, you know, in, in South Africa, for example, there was a famous case at a formerly Afrikaans university, now run, now the, the vice chancellor for which is a, an interesting um, uh, mixed race man, uh, where white Afrikaans students uh, urinated in a bowl of soup and then gave the soup to, uh, without of course telling her, to one of the black cleaning women at the university, and she ate the soup, right? Not, and then and then they let her know, right? And then that complete degradation and humiliation. And there was a, a big national outcry as a, a function of that, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, you can look it up. Right? So, so the you know the standard response, you know, drawing on a slew of data and these kinds of instances all over the place. You can similarly in Europe, and I'm sure in Canada. So sort of find uh, instances of this kind, um, you know, is the sort of response of the likes of Kim Crenshaw, Sumi Cho, sort of others like this, Anna Everett, are we post-racial yet? It's like, well, no, obviously not, right? I mean, even David Stern, the commissioner of the National Basketball Association, gets it, right? I mean, he says, we've gone from people objecting to Afros to people objecting to cornrows. We know better than most that America is not post-racial. I mean, a remarkable statement from a guy like him, right? Um, but, you know, clearly, clearly not. So um, I, I want to shift terrain. I mean, that, that, I mean, as important as that response is, right, it strikes me as too obvious. I mean, right? I mean, you sort of look around you. And so, so the real question is, what is the work that the conception of the, uh, of the post-racial is doing? What work is it doing in relation to the racial? How is it re-extending the racial anew, right? And, and the racist anew, right? So, you know, and I, I want to trace those logics out sort of through, through, through the rest of this, right? So the first is to ask, so what is the genealogy of the post-racial? I think you can trace the genealogy of the notion of the term to the post-war emergence Right of um, the UN statements on race, Ashley Montague and all those guys in 1947-48, uh, and the statements. There were five versions of the statement from 1947-48 onwards, right? Um, uh, and you know the 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 response in Europe to the war, and by extension in in, in the US, right? To you know, race is not a biological category. We should pay no attention to it in those terms. And the social should not invoke race. They sort of backed off of it after they got a bit of pushback from other people. But that was the sort of thrust, generally. And then from that to the kind of you know post-1954 civil rights movement, right, in the US, um, along with the Freedom Charter in South Africa, which was 1955, 1956, Right, so in the case of the U.S., a kind of color blindness, you know, a, a recourse to a claim to color blindness, right? Uh, and in the case of South Africa, the Freedom Charter, explicitly a recourse to claims of non-racialism, right? Uh, and that's what the society should be predicated on in each respective instance. So, in a in a way, what I'm suggesting is that um, the the sort of claims to where, what else we have called racelessness. Right in these variety of versions, right? Um, come uh, are the forerunners, are the genealogy of the of, of this conception of post-racial, and then the post-racial gets tied to and gets given a kind of explicitation, right, in relation to globalization. More recently, I mean, the sort of versions of globalization that appear, you know, from the 1970s or 1980s onwards, the growing connectivity of everywhere. The kind of traveling concepts, local inflections, and instantiations. So I can ask then about uh, you know the work that the post ratio, as I say, is doing. Um, the relation, right, given that we're now in the post 1980s moment, sort of the relation of the post ratio to the neoliberal, right? So. What about the neoliberal? Well, the economic anthropology of classic liberalism is homo economicus, 
right? I mean, a kind of possessive individual, right, about which Macpherson, a famous Canadian political theorist, uh, you know, was long at the University of Toronto, wrote about and uh, rather interestingly, right? Um, I want to. I mean, following Foucault, there's a, there's a wonderful throw, a, a throwaway line in the birth of biopolitics, which is about the history of neoliberalism, right? I mean, if you haven't looked at it, you should go. It's not a, yeah, I, I don't want to say it's not about biopolitics. I mean, it's a good deal about biopolitics. But, you know, he, 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 was, he, he declared that he was going to do a set of lectures at the end of the 1970s on biopolitics. And he got into the lecture you know, at the Collège de France. He got into the room. And he couldn't stop himself from speaking about neoliberalism explicitly in 1979. Nobody else was talking about it in 1979. It's extraordinary. And then he gives a long history, going back to the 1920s, right, of, of the sort of birth of the emergence of neoliberalism. And in, in this text, the wonderful text, he, he talks of the, almost the, the, the sort of economic anthropology of neoliberalism as the man he says, the man of enterprise. It's a really, really interesting move, right? He doesn't say much more about it than that. But when you begin to think about it, what, I mean, what does the man of enterprise amount to, right, in this neoliberal sort of context, right? So the man of enterprise, I mean, the enterprising man, right, right, is the man who makes and makes it up, right? The man of self-making. I mean, that's what's so important to Foucault after all, right, at that period in, in time, right? The man, from our point of view, 30 plus years later, of mashup and remixing, right? Of, of the make it kind of generation, right? Kind of um, the, the person of self advantage, of self promotion, and of self benefit, and of self profit, right? I mean, if, if social good comes out of all of that, well and good. But it's not the, it, it's not the drive of, what, of how we do what we do, right? That drive is about advancing oneself, right? Um, it's about looking hip or looking good and looking cool, right? Um, about, uh, in a sense, looking like one's in control even as one's on the border of being out of control. I mean, so sort of all these things, I think, come together. It's about the man of innovation and design, right? I mean, these sort of tropes of our, of our contemporary moment, right? About fabrication in both senses of the term, of making oneself through making oneself up, right? A kind of make-believe, right? Where the make-believe is fantasy making it up, but also compelling others to believe in what you make. Um, and, um, you know, you can think of extreme sports. I mean, the shift from extreme, extreme sports as recreation to recreation to a kind of, you know, a centerpiece of contemporary capitalization, which it is, you know, I mean, after all, and everything, the cultures that go around. Right? So, you know, I want to ask, um, you know, recreation, I mean, sorry, extreme sports becomes not so much a recreation as a vocation. No. I mean, it's what youth aspire to be, right? Uh, and old guys like me aspire to, sort of, in my fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, how does, um, you know, how does the post racial operate in the context of work? So, the first thing to say is it personalizes and individualizes responsibility. I mean, that's the neoliberal is about personalizing and, and, and individualizing responsibility. So in racial terms, that means one's not responsible for one's race, right? Um, you know, the, uh, this is a very interesting photograph. It was uh, Glenn Beck's Million Man March, right? It's kind of, and, you know, the only black guy who showed up, right, showed up, right, with a camera and the sign Right to have white guys kind of take a photograph with him for five bucks a piece. Right, so kind of, I mean, so you begin to see the twists and turns sort of taking place. Um, so not re I'm not responsible. One is not responsible for one's for one's race or uh, or those of one's race, others. Right, 
And in a sense, one's race is not responsible for one, one's responsible for oneself. So it's this in radical individualization of personal responsibility. Right? Um, and you see a, a sort of version of it embedded in John McWhorter, the, the uh, conservative linguist at City University. Kind of, he's been inspired by stuff. Right? The second thing to say is that, um, you know, alongside of this, it individualizes responsibility for racist expression. Racism, then, is seen as an anomaly of individuals. It's no longer some, something structural, right? Um, it, it, you know, um, it's, uh, you know, racism is a kind of anomaly, right? Um, reducible to individual uh, excess, you might say. Uh, or even to just a ragging, I was just kidding, right? I mean, a, a very common response when one's called on it. And then the third thing is that, um, you know, it also, there's been this emergence, as I have sort of hinted at, uh, of making up one's personal uh, racial life story, right? Uh, and social identity for the sake of self-advantage. So there have been a slew of instances. I mean, Jason Blair in the New York Times, for example, kind of fabricating, right, uh, certain stories uh, in, in order to, right, get himself published repeatedly. Or uh, James Frey, or, you know, the case in San Francisco of the, um, um, of the woman who, uh, author who posed as, um, uh, as a, um, uh, uh, as a, um, a prostitute, right, on the street and so on and so forth. Um, a boy prostitute, actually, on the street uh, of, of color. Or the, or the woman from LA who, you know, had a perfectly happy family in LA, a white woman, but who was adopted or wrote that she was adopted in Portland by a black mother and, and was brought up by a black mother, and so on and so forth. These series of fabricated stories that become kind of national hits you know, only to discover that they're fabricated. Well, should the fabrication change the fact? I mean, you know, I mean, is is veritability a condition of good writing, right? So kind of, uh, I mean, in a certain manner of speaking, you know, there's a kind of interesting set of questions there. So there are a whole sling of these things. Um, so th there's a sense in which you could say avatar culture elasticizes the reach while multiplying the range of the self-making. And in doing so, individualized responsibility is instantaneously magnified. Social life takes on a kind of game-like quality with all the, the implications thus entail. So the post racial becomes kind of shorthand for general, and this is shifting back into the sort of structural moment, for generalized social equality of opportunity. Right? Um, I mean, liberalism has long, I mean, think of affirmative action. Liberalism has long associated itself with um, a, a generalized social equality of opportunity. And the way this is played out in the wake of the civil rights movement and so on is usually by way of saying we're going to equalize the opportunities for training, right? Going to college, getting a degree, getting a diploma, getting technical training and so on and so forth. And then everybody competes equally, right? I mean, you've had your chance, you're, you, know, you come out, uh, everybody sort of gets you know, so equal in, and then you compete against each other on sort of equal grounds coming out and make the best person win, right? What the neoliberal does, I think, is to undercut that, that, that version in the following way. It still declares itself, right, through a kind of mer meritocratic commitment to a generalized social equality of opportunity, but the opportunity now is just to be considered. It's no longer an equality of training, you right, and an equality of access to the conditions of possibility that would allow one to compete on equal grounds. It's just anybody can apply, right? But the best people, namely the best trained people, will win. And the best trained people are the ones with the most goodies, right? And those folks, because of family history, 20 to 1 we saw, right, tend to be whites and make it into you know, the better universities and so on and so forth. So you've shifted downwards this notion of equality of social opportunities from right, equal access to kind of education now to you know, equal access, e equal consider, you know, well, not even equal consideration, equal possibility of being considered, right? Um, 
uh, and, and so it hides from view these deeper structural sort of conditions. The other thing it does, the post-racial, you know, almost unpredictably, maybe, maybe we should have predicted this, a license to free expression. Anybody can say anything, pretty much, right? Um, so it erodes the barriers accordingly to racist expression. I can say what I want, how I want, when I want, think of the Danish cartoons, right? It's a very, very robust kind of uh, commitment in Europe. We're all about free speech, right? It doesn't matter who gets kind of dissed or attacked or antagonized by it, right? And so you get the kind of likes of Geert Wilders, right, who's now a major player in the Dutch parliament, right? Saying the damnedest things about the Quran, for example, I mean, right, he, he makes us move this really degrad uh, degrading film about the Quran. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, people before him, like uh, Theo van Gogh, who lost his life, right, and Pim Fortuyn before that, uh, Rita Verdonk, right, who was a minister, effectively the minister of the interior, oversaw kind of immigration and justice issues in, uh, in, in places like Holland, right. Um, Right, and in Denmark, as I say, I mean, yeah, you support Denmark. I mean, if you go Google responses to the cartoon controversy, you'll pull up a website that basically is a guy sort of, um, you know, uh, ironizing the kind of criticism of the Danish cartoons, right? And in the end, so coming out, I mean, the, the end, you know, you, you scroll through a whole lot of sort of ironic kind of responses about. Oh, we didn't help them at all. Oh, we didn't give them employment. Oh, we didn't, you know, but they didn't even learn our language. And, and the end is fuck off, right? So kind of, I mean, literally, that's, that's what the... Uh, so you, you see this way in which the post-racial sort of licenses the possibility of free expression. It empties the racial of its conventional meanings to be filled with any meanings chosen whatsoever. So the racial becomes prolific and becomes a kind of cipher that allows anything to be said and expressed in its name. So race becomes seen as a kind of, you could say, a fulfilling, a prophecy, a divination, a prediction, a define, a, 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 the divine, always already known. And what's the always already known? The always already known of history, the always already known of personality, of character, right? Of, of national character. So green scribes. Right, those historical sort of tropes, you might say, those historic, historical fixations um, on um, the, the, the racial characterization of the body politic. And in that sense, it becomes um, a green scribes a destiny in the name of its supposed denial. Right? Uh, think of the return of the genetics of race. Why, why do the genetics of race return now? Right? I mean, exactly at this moment of the frustration, in medicine, in uh, biotechnology, uh, and, and so on. And there's a long, there's a, a fabulous book coming out uh, on sort of uh, genetics and, and identity by Nadia Abu Al Haj at Barnard College uh, called The Genealogical Science, which is a very, very careful critique of, um, of uh, sort of these. Uh, of the science of genetics in relation to, to, to these kinds of genealogies. Yeah, it's coming out from Chicago. So, um, the neo the, so the post racial becomes a pure political theology. It compels belief in the unbelievable. I mean, that's what political theology does. Right? Compels belief in the unbelievable. The unseen truth in, there you go, socialities of the skin. Um, and, and there you see the, the, you know, the, the sort of um, way in which conviction is, is sewn into this sort of conception, uh, both racially and, and theologi theologically. Uh, race as a kind of conviction, as a make-believe, right? Uh, and, um, uh, and, and a kind of condemnation. So r the post-racial also then um, operates as a deflection. Right? Even as it's inscribing these things, it operates as a deflection. What do I mean by that? It deflects from attending to racial disparity or humiliation. Right? It draws attention away from it. Right? Um, uh, uh, of, of harm or, or, or of in injury. And I mean, this is one example among literally tens of thousands. I mean, if you Google Obama racism images, 
right? You will bring up, I mean, uh, it, it, it's quite unbelievable, actually. But it is tens of thousands of images not unlike this, right? Uh, that just go on and on. I mean, you know, uh, stuff that's just terrific, both about Obama and Michelle Obama and the sort of characterization. So what I mean by deflection is this draws attention away from the actual debate around health, you know, the health care bill in America, right? By making the, the controversy about this, right? Uh, not not attending to the actual structural conditions of who has access to healthcare and who doesn't uh, in, in, in the U.S. Um, right, and, and and the deflection sort of take the you know the, the form uh, these things never crossed uh, my mind or they were furthest from my mind. I mean, when you call people, on that, oh, that's not me. No intention there, right? Kind of, uh, and, and so on. So there's a sense in which. You know, the invisible man of the 1940s and 1950s, I mean, Ralph Edison, right, becomes invisible condition. The conditions, you might say, preferred invisibility, uh, lost in the fog of a kind of social spectacularity. In more intimate settings, I'm simply coexisting with those like me, in looks and likes, means of manageability. In matters of individual racist expression, the apology is invariably for the offense taken never for causing the harm, right? Invariably it's, I am sorry if you are offended, making you the problem, right? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but hey, right? It's your problem, right? You, you're acting out over here, right? Kind of, so deflection in, 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 in those senses. So what, it, it allows the possibility to assert raciality as a condition, or a kind of conditionality, without calling attention to the, ra to the raciality of the conditions in play. Right? So it's both inscribing and deflecting away from that inscription. Right? Um, and I think here of uh, David Starkey in the wake of the London riots last year. Right? Then we lost here. Um, you know, when he says, uh, you know, the looters were acting black. Right? An amazing statement. And then when he's called on it, right, he says, Oh, I don't, I don't mean anything racial, I'm just talking about culture, huh? right? So kind of, I mean, like there's not, you know, five, five centuries of race in the name of culture, right? So kind of, I mean, quite striking. So you, you, you see the way in which sort of this, this plays out. Um, or I don't have a racist bone in my body, I mean, that kind of stuff, right? Um, so, uh, you know, there's, you, one can talk about racisms without, I mean, you know, it's common now to talk about racisms without race. And sort of erase the categories by which to refer to. Right? I almost prefer to talk about racisms without racism. Right? I mean, these things are operating, but there's nothing that enables us to, to name it for what it is. Right? I mean, it, it's been eroded and erased from the possibility of identification. Um, right? A kind of avatar culture. I mean, what's the difference between these characters? And, and, and this flattening out of, of racial distinction into, you know, the same sort of facial structure but just changing color, sort of, you know, is a kind of metaphor for what's going on. So I want to shift grounds just for a minute um, and suggest that uh, the post-racial is to the racial as the post-colonial is to the colonial. So what do I mean by that? I mean, there was a whole debate in the early 1990s, Ed Niappier and Anne McClintock um, uh, and uh, Ella Shohat, right? All had articles that you know, were titled something like, right, what is the post in, in post-colonialism? Or what is the post in post-colonialism? And uh, an interesting debate, so you go back and sort of read that with, with, with this in mind, right? So the first thing to point out is, um, you know, modern, I mean, in these debates, uh, Appiah points out that uh, for modernism and colonialism, it's about exclusivity and categorical distinctions. So, mod, you know, the, modernism and colonialism are about inscribing categorical distinctions. Right? So, the post in each of these cases signals a kind of new material distinction or differentiation without naming them categorically. And just as the post in post-colonial doesn't signal, does not signal the end of the colonial, 
it signals a new modality in terms of which the colonial operates, right? I mean, that, you know, in the 60s came to be called neo, or the 70s came to be called neo-colonialism, right? So I want to suggest that the post, in relation to the post-racial, which should now be obvious from what I've hitherto said, is a new set of modalities in terms of which race is operating. It's not the end of race, right? It's a, it's a, and, and so one has to ask oneself, how is race operating in these times, in these moments, in the wake of, 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 of these conditions? And McClintock, in this debate, remarks, in this previous debate, remarks that the shift from the colonial to the post-colonial signals a, a shift from relations of power, the colonized and the colonized, to the linearity of time, progress from the before to the after. Right? Um, in doing so, it covers over those who continue to be benefit and suffer from the post-colonial condition, the so-called ex-colonizers and their casualties, as she calls it. Something like this logic, I want to suggest, operates at the level of the post racial as well. So I'm kind of mirroring onto to that debate. So just as the post and the post-colonial is not the end but the afterlife of the colonial, so to the post in the post-racial, it's the afterlife, the ghostly haunting by the racial of the so social supposedly rid of the racial. To be post-racial, just as to be post-colonial, is to imply, if not to admit, that the society in question must have been racial, just as it was once engaged in colonial practice. But the implication of raciality is not quite admission. Indeed, it is implicatively a denial of its once and present racism. The post-racial, then, is racial as spirit condition. Right of the social. Sociality is unnamed because unnameable spirit. I mean, the terms have disappeared, right? So you can't even name it in these terms. Um, it's uh, shadow being. The post-racial, as I said, is another modality of racially marked uh, and racially exclusionary sociality. The we are not or are no longer racial becomes a way of being racially inscribed. Uh, the post is the passing, I use that term, Carefully, right? The post is the passing of the racial, not in the sense of its being passed, right, or um, of its being over in the past, but in the sense of its no longer quite marked extension in the now and what transpires in its, we might say, namelessness. Right? So in each case, it's its afterlife. It's you know, in, in each of the post cases, it's it's the afterlife. And there's some marvelous people sort of uh, thinking about the, right, and this is obviously a plan, a plan of Libya, right, kind of uh, George Chakrabarti sort of, uh, you know, playing with the, with the categories, or Tracy Moffat in Australia sort of, uh, you know, reflecting on uh, the Asianization, <laughs> as it's put, it, uh, of the demography in the Australian case, and so on and so forth, and, and, and the relation to the outcome. Okay, so what are the logics, the post-racial logics at work, right? Um, so there are a few ways, in, you know, a few sort of humorous ways in, in, in which uh, one can get at this, right? Um, obviously, uh, a, a kind of critique of uh, affirmative action, or a critique of the critique of affirmative action. Um, you know, and likewise, a kind of critique of, of uh, who, who's the beneficiary of affirmative action and who's recognized or not recognized as a beneficiary of, of affirmative, affirmative action. So how does the post-racial work? What work does it do um, sort of in, in these instances? The first is to say that it expands new markets. What does one mean by this? Well, capitalism, I mean, John Stuart Mill noted already in the 1850s, right, I mean, uh, um, in, in his essays on uh, political economy, that a center kind of piece of the workings of, um, uh, of capital is the need constantly to be creating new markets, right? I mean, capital, capital grows through expansion, and expansion means bringing people who hitherto were not, I mean, that's why China is so important today, right? We need the Chinese market, America and Canada and Europe says, right? Because it brings in new consuming subjects into the possibility that then expands the possibility of, of selling new goods. It's both selling new goods but also designing new goods that 
old consumers might buy. Hence, you've got to have a new car every couple of years, and so on and so on, and a new model, right? So Honda's, you know, CRV gets remade every five years because it can't look like the old model because people would say, oh, my old model, you know, will go for 15 years. Why should I buy a new one? Well, because it now looks different, right? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So what uh, the post-racial does, the post-racial is committed to a kind of mixture. I mean, that's its kind of front, its face, right? So that kind of mixed race condition comes along with post racial right? You're interacting with each other. Not only when it doesn't. I mean, there was a, a report the other day I was telling um, Henry and Susan uh, last night from Mississippi. You know, 29% of people in, in, in Mississippi think that mixed marriage is wrong, should be made illegal. And another 21% are insured. So half the population, right? I'm, I'm tempted to say half the population of of Mississippi old enough to think, but it's really half the population old enough not to think, right? It's kind of thinks that you know mixed mixed relationships are, are sort of should be out of the question, right? So we should go back to pre-loving Virginia, right? And, and I mean it's just stunning. Um, so, uh, but you know you can ask why in popular culture mixed race, mixed interactions, right? In Benetton ads in sort of things like this, right, become a kind of focus. And it really is the creation of new markets, of new, seeing oneself in new ways, and then buying products that reflect that, that, that new way of seeing. So there's a sense in which, right, um, uh, this post-raciality represents market potential. And I put this, I mean, one could do all kinds of um, uh, demographic kind of illustrations on this. But Utah, you know, which is Mormon country and, you know, used to be kind of all Mormons and a couple of American Indians, right? Now it's becoming much more demographically mixed, right? And it too is looking to this new kind of demo demographic configuration to expand itself. And we'll see later on Mississippi sort of similarly and so on and so forth, right? Um, and so, um, you know, it becomes, a, I mean, there's a kind of limit, uh, 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 a threshold to this kind of demographic mixture. And in the United States, I mean, my, my sense, it's a rough sense, I haven't really done any sort of uh, data studies of this, but just sort of thinking across a whole range of data points, casually, um, informally, 20% uh, right, of, of mixture, of heterogeneity in the population, whether it's in an institution like a university or in a state, becomes the kind of threshold point. After that, right, the kind of whites kick back. So there's a reason why in the United States, as you know, university populations kind of approach 20% uh, not white in, in you know, the general university populations in California, in Michigan, in Texas, I mean, the three main, main areas, well, there's a, a huge kickback legally against affirmative action. Right? It's the threshold point. In Europe, it's like 5%. Right? I mean, uh, you can play it out in, 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 in various ways in, you know, in, in relation, say, to Muslim populations in particular. Right? Okay. So, okay, expanding new markets. I want to say the post racial operates also by an in denial. Right? A denial of historical conditions, a denial of contemporary constraints and expression in relation to the racial. But also are the terms for revealing, naming, analyzing, and so addressing or redressing uh, all modes of racist expression and effects. A denial, a denial not just of historical conditions, but of the contemporary constraints, the legacy of racially driven inequalities, structured by those historical conditions reproduced over time. Right? So it's just like waving the historical away. The, the historical just becomes a kind of museum, you know, a, a possibility for further museum consumption, basically, where you go to buy goods. The post-racial, in that sense, buries, I mean, Susan was, was uh, using this language in, in her introduction, it buries alive those very conditions that are the grounds of its own making. Buried alive, those conditions continue to constitute a hold, a handicap, a disability uh, at the intersection of race and class. There's some very interesting work in, in recent times on, on race and disability, going both ways, right? It's going to be the uh, work with me. Um, of race and class, and those still forced to bear the load. Class standing mitigates and mediates the load, and admitting some into the register of the privileges of whiteness, 
without dissolving or compensating completely for the accumulated conditions. So the first thing to point out is a, is a, a deniability, right? Um, this, this denial of these conditions. Right? And um, anybody recognize this? Anybody know what this is? So this is the Museum of Tolerance, right? Which is slated for Jerusalem. Right? There's a Museum of Tolerance in LA, some in Wheat, Wheat and Talk Center, right? post-Holocaust sort of reflection and so on. And they're looking to build the Museum of Tolerance in Jerusalem, right? Um, and uh, it is being placed on um, a very long-standing cemetery, the Mamiya Cemetery, right? Which is an old Palestinian cemetery. And in order to clear the ground for the museum, they've literally bulldozed away right, the remaining skeletal bodies of 150, 200, 300 year old people who are very sacred ground for Palestinians, right? very close to the apartheid wall. In, in, in a park, I'll show you an image of um, in a minute. So Frank Gehry, I mean, it was supposed to be a Frank Gehry book, right? Uh, classic Frank Gehry book, and we got involved, and a very close colleague of mine at UCLA wrote a wonderful <coughs> critical piece in Critical Inquiry. His name is Sari Matisi, it's Saeed's nephew. And um, a, a really fabulous piece uh, that generated all kinds of controversy, criticizing what was going on. And Gary, to cut a long, long story short, Gary finally got hold of him, um, apologized, and withdrew from the project, I mean, partly because the, the, the folks in Israel kind of bankrolling and got cold feet, uh, but partly because Gary got cold feet and didn't want to be associated with it anymore. So, so you know, humanistic work sometimes works, right? It's an important point politically, right? And they replaced it by the white dawn, right? So, kind of, so a more bunker-like structure, right? And um, so this is the this is the cemetery in which it's right that has been cleared in order to build it, right? In in this part of the in the well-known part. Right? So it's a denial of these conditions, but it also when being called, being called on it, it's a denial of the denial. I mean, it's recursive. Right? So it's not, just, it's not just that I'm denying that I'm doing these things. I'm also denying that I'm denying that I'm doing these things. Right? So any possibility of getting a handle on it kind of evaporates. And this is the work I'm saying on the post racial right? Um, it's not just a denial of lingering racial conditionality. It's discarding of the ra racial to the past of history. It is more than that. The post in this post-racial is the denial about post-racial denial. Deniability is recursive refusal. I assert my, in this case, probably non-racial, my post-racial innocence, not just by denying that I any longer or ever make or made racial reference or mobilized racist exclusion. I mean, is Israelis were like, Race, that was the Holocaust, that's not us, right? Kind of, um, I now further deny that I am in denial. I can't possibly be racist now because I never was then. My tolerance now, my openness to all otherness, or even more strongly to all my otherness, is evidence of my characteristic tolerance. Right? Uh, so I couldn't have been racist then too. I can't be in denial because tolerant then as now, denial was then an issue. So post-raciality reaches also for this denial of denial. I've turned my historical past into an empty white canvas. Right? Into an empty white canvas. Perhaps even a canvas of whiteness. Or even more pointedly, a canvassing of whiteness. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it up. I'm making it mine. The post-racial then is nothing less than the vanishing point of race and the supposed, supposedly fading pinprick of racism. And as I say, the, um, you know, the Museum of Torrance, uh, which gives itself the title the Center for Human Dignity. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, in the name of the you know, bones are being kind of thrown away, uh, people are being displaced, killed, uh, and so on. So the, uh, the kind of political, economic, demographic exclusions, right, become, as Sari Matisi puts it in relation to, to this case, clean, pure, and total, 
right? I mean, it, it, it's right? um, in a sense of invisible, not seen at all, uh, and, and as a consequence, uh, out of mind. And so, not only does it operate by deflection, denial, denial of denial, it also operates by a series of depositation, by a series of reversals. Right? So the reversals take this kind of form. Right? I mean, this is kind of, yeah, it's another one of those images you find online. Right? Um, the kind of free ride to the oval, you know, the, this kind of racial kind of um, dismissal. Or, you know, this has become quite common. Racism cuts both ways. So it's whites are as much, right, or the white privilege are as much a product of, um, uh, of, of, of the stuff as uh, people of color are. I, l I love this image, the kind of no race cream image, right? It's kind of, you can put some kind of cream on your face and, you know, just as there was white and cream once, says now, the no race cream, <laughs> right? Uh, or more pointedly, at Berkeley, you'll notice the school plaza kind of uh, thing. There was, uh, you know, white students, uh, Republicans actually, young Republicans on campus, did this bake sale, right, where Asians paid a dollar fifty for the cookies, whites paid a dollar, and Latinos and blacks paid only fifty cents as a way of critiquing kind of affirmative action, right? which caused a huge furor, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So again, you see uh, uh, these sense of uh, the sense of reversals sort of being being ordered over here. Or Sarah Palin recently. I mean, when uh, every any, I, I take it you know who Derek Bell was, right? um, the famous cr critical race scholar who was at Harvard and then resigned from Harvard in protest when they wouldn't hire any other black folk, right? And went to NYU, uh, and he died a couple of weeks ago, like about a month ago. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, you know, in the wake of his obituary and so on, an old uh, clip surfaced of Barack Obama as the, um, uh, as the Law Journal president at Harvard, embracing Derek Bell uh, at the time of this protest and so on, and caused like a huge outcry on the right. You know, it's Derek Bell, the guy just died. I mean, he was a major figure, right? He was a wonderful man, a really decent human being. And, um, you know, uh, the likes of Sarah Penn, I mean, she was explicit about it, but I mean, other people were saying the same thing, um, you know, accusing Derek Bell of being racist, for being critical of racism, right? I mean, so you, s I mean, Sarah Palin, I mean, please, right? It's a kind of. So you see the kind of um, reversals that kick in place of the kind that I'm, I'm, I'm just carrying on. Okay, so the, po the post-racial ends the possibility of seeing racisms, their structures of enablements, conditions of possibility, and the end also their pernicious effects. Right, so, um, you know, um, this sort of thing so becomes... Uh, um, uh, I should probably move on. I mean, we want to leave some time for discussion. Okay. We end at two, or, or at what time? Do you? Oh. Yeah, I mean, the workshop. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's still some time. So I can keep going. Yeah. Okay. So um, the post-racial, then, um, <coughs> uh, you know, I mean, you get um, uh, this is the image. I mean, that's the sort of London right starky again. Right. Uh, the image of you know the whites have become black. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so the post ratio enables the production and extension of conditions of sustained precarity. Right? Uh, I mean, that notion of precariousness, to which increasingly, you know, not just the historical precarious, the kind of so called underclass and so I mean, we're all now increasingly closer to a condition of precarity, right? Uh, in our economic lives. In our and I, I mean this collectively. I mean the 99 percent, right? Um, really are closer to being precarious, uh, right? In terms of uh, healthcare, in terms of you know, as the conditions of social life are dramatically being er er eroded, right? Uh, the disparities between de-raised privileged and racially defaulted disprivileged kind of is made to be rendered invisible. Blacks remain poor, and the poor, in a sense, are made to, made to be black, right? 
uh, you get, I mean, in the case of friends, right? So sort of this kind of um, representation. Um, uh, or in the case of South Africa, right? I mean, this is a chilling image that appeared on Facebook. So this is an Afrikaner nationalist, right? A guy who would like to bring back apartheid, right? And he, he put this image on his Facebook page. Um, and it, you know, the, I mean, it looks like it's just shot as you would an animal, a young black kid, right? I mean, so it reconjures the Hector Peterson uh, sort of image from 1976, right, of the, the father carrying his son, kind of shot by the police, right, uh, gloating like a trophy over his kill, right? And um, it's unclear how, you know, how, how. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, how mashup this is, right? I mean, whether it's been um, edited to sort of produce this, and, and actually there's an inquiry taking place in South Africa. I mean, he, he can be gotten, you know, for the for the mashup. I mean, if it is just a mashup, but clearly for the killing, if it represents a killing. And maybe the even more horrifying statistic is that in a day he had 600 friends on Facebook. Right? So, so I mean, you can see the way. Stuff like this goes viral. I'm, I'm going to take that image off because it's what it's doing. Um, so the post the post racial then embodies a kind of um, uh, what I call an epistemology of deception. Right. Things are not as they appear racially to be. Uh, the post post raciality fails, really refuses to comply to live up to preordained expectations about how racial configuration and racist expression manifest. Slavery's emancipation was brought about by, rep by Republicans, right? I mean, this is now the, you know, so, I mean, you got these reversals. You know, and, and this is what I mean by a kind of epistemology of deception. So slavery's em emancipation is credited to Republicans, which, you know, technically it was, but it was those Republicans then, you know, it was Lincoln, wasn't the, the guys today. <laughs> Um, the black U.S. president is committed to enlarging racial dependency for African Americans. Right? Profiling Muslims as potential terrorists is demanded by social security. Muslim American students peacefully disrupting the Israeli ambassador's rationalization of Gaza's invasion, in this case on the campus I inhabit, right, turn out to be violating the ambassador's free speech rights. Right? I mean, so you see this sort of series of reversals that are kicking into place. Right? Uh, Dutch anti-racists criticizing the uh, Sinterklaas. Do you all know what Sinterklaas is? So it's December 6th. So it's a pre-Christmas kind of celebration of the figure of Santa Claus, right? so, which is kind of everywhere in Holland. Right? Um, uh, right? It comes, it's a big, it's a bigger, almost the biggest, it's a bigger public celebration certainly than Christmas. Christmas is a kind of family thing. Right? Um, uh, so, uh, Dutch anti-racist criticizing the Santa Claus Day, uh, Svarte Pit is racist. So the central figure of the Svarte Pit uh, sort of celebration, of, of the Santa Claus celebration, is Black Peter, right? And Black Peter is a Sambo-esque figure that appears in every shop window, and every storefront, and every department store in kind of more than life size. I mean, it's incredible, right? and particularly if you're a person of color, I mean, you, you leave Holland at that time. And it's it's uh, quite amazing, right? And, um, you know, in, in, uh, there, there's been, over the years, sort of some attempt to, to resist and protest, particularly by young people of color. And this last December 6th, a series of students, some of whom were students of ours, were, um, uh, were protesting and were beaten up by the police for peacefully protesting Spite the Pit. I mean, Spite the Pit, right, is the kind of national uh, mascot of, of the Dutch. I mean, what does that say about, about the national self right, in some sense? That it's a Sambo, Sambo figure. So, um, uh, protesting as racist or offending the national mascot and disrupting the pleasure of the nation. The most explicitly non racial character currently in American politics is the one. Well, at the time I wrote this, Herman Cain, is the one most vehemently claiming to be targeted racially as soon as his sordid past is surfaced. Right? So 
you know, I'm non-racial, I'm elevating myself through non-racial, but as soon as I'm attacked, oh, it's racism, right? I mean, again, it's a sort of condition for of invisibility. It is not that post-raciality reshuffles the structural deck, quite the contrary. It re-articulates and redirects the modes of expression, rationalization and, and explanation of, extent, of extended racialities, their effects and refusal. So at the heart of post-raciality's condition of deception is what Akbar Abbas, my colleague, in a more generalized mode, calls a state of disappointment. A state of disappointment. Disappointments fail to conform to their appointed places. I mean, it, of course, is both affected disappointment, right? But it fails to live up to its appointed, you know, what one expects of it. I mean, that's it's this, it's standing back from its appointed place, right? Uh, to be to appointed modes of being and doing, to conventional in this case, race, sociality. At one states of ordinariness with recognizable everyday markers, residential, recreational resourceful, socially containable, exploitable, they nevertheless are out of the ordinary, refusing their appointed and so anticipated sites or roles, unrecognizable as in their everydayness. They are dislocations, and in a sense you might call them dislocutions, <clears throat> appearing where least anticipated and expressing themselves in unexpected and unpredictable ways. They accordingly lack location or precisely locatedness in terms of their comprehensibility. So a state's or social condition's disappointedness is a source and manifestation of its at least partially, its partial illegibility, right? The fact that it's not where one would expect it to be makes one not able to read it. Right? Uh, spawning perhaps a crisis of social representation and control, the social conditions of everyday life here can no longer be taken for granted, assumed to deliver or underwrite or guarantee, as the state once did, the baseline daily conditions of existence. The state has gotten out of that business, so to speak. The post-ratio helps to make less or illegible the generalized condition to of racial expanding precarity. The proliferation of the conditions of precarious possibility, I mean, in a, you know, as a social register. Even as it helps to reproduce the very condition it refuses by withholding the terms of recognition. A precarity both epistemological and ontological. So, Right? Just as our condition ontologically becomes precarious, so the conditions of its epistemological recognition, its knowing, right, disappears from view. Um, <clears throat> so these disappointments of uh, uh, their dislocations and dislocutions renders racialities and the precarities they enable, as I say, illegible. It produces the inevitability as well as the dread that there is no longer the future once imagined, uh, right, in all its complexities, racially and otherwise. Um, so, uh, sorry, I've, I've skipped over a few uh, images, uh, so, so I'm running a bit behind. I and mean, this is an image of right, the Republican convention where they got a, a comic to come and mimic Obama in order to send him out. And, you know, everybody laughed until he started turning attention to a critique of the, of the Republican platform as a joke. And he got marched off stage, right? So you can see the sort of reverse, I mean, literally. And then ended up on Saturday Night Live to complete his, uh, his, his stand-up. We don't know, you know, this is probably a mashup, right? It's a kind of, uh, but, you know, the horror of a Ku Klux Klan leader being gunned down Right, at least in the imagination, and then being whirled into the surgery room and being attended to by a bunch of black doctors and nurses. Right, it's kind of um, right, the, the sort of reversible reversibility is kind of taking place, sort of in and through all of this, and then you know uh, uh, these conditions. But the, this notion of a kind of um, reversibility uh, that then makes illegible sort of the conditions that are taking place. I mean, anybody know what this image is? No, no idea. Three guesses. I mean, it's really, th this image is really interesting. Okay, you get a beer if you guess. <laughs> yes. I, I can see I'm going to have to put this up in a kind of eBay, so eBay sale over here. It's just going to be a, a bottle of scotch and then it's going to be yeah. <laughs> Any ideas? Any, any, anybody willing to take a guess? 
Yeah, good one. Wow, you get the beer. <laughs> you should have, you should have waited for others to. <laughs> yeah, it's the English Defence League, right? Um, which is a uh, you know English nationalist, white English nationalist operation. So uh, you know which identifies itself with the kind of struggle of Israel, right, against the appearance of people of Arab and Muslim descent in its in its side. This is the. RBFB and AWB, which is Africana, South African kind of white nationalist, proto, not proto, probably fascist organization, um, uh, and so on. So if living in a critical condition, in both senses of the term though, right? Living in a critical condition, precarious on the one hand, and critical on the other, opens up the recognition that there is no or no longer a future as once we knew or had come to expect it, this so-called non-future, the generalized state of precariousness, is ordered through race. Race not only identifies who is subject or subjected to a futureless precarity, one's proximity to precarity ascribes to one a raciality otherwise less ontologically binding. The proliferating, you might ask, endless or eternal repetitions disappoint not only in dashing the prediction of the yet to come, but also in the sense of spoiling the refusals of the deadening drudgery invigorating spaces, however fleeting, not be useful to the assimilator. So thinking in terms of an epistemology of deception implies a modernity not as progress, but as a social folding in on itself to stay off the polluting, if ceaselessly fascinating, and so enticing horrors of what Philip Dick has called dust people. That is a, a, some of you must have seen the, um, the Adjustment Bureau with Matt Damon, that film as it was. Well, there's a much more interesting uh, short story on which it's based by Philip Dick called The Adjustment Team, written in 1954, in which he talks about, you know, sort of disappearing behind, you know, the, 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 the sort of structures of reality opened up and the main figure kind of disappears and sees dust people. And I'm using this character of dust people Right, particularly if you link it to, you know, the proliferating geographies of walking today uh, that are associated with m migration, right, and with precarious migration. So this notion of dust pe people as a metaphor for how, we, both for how we think about these conditions, right? I mean, dissolving subjectivities, dissoluting sub subjectivities on the one hand, but also the play of dust. I mean, this is part of another piece of work, right? The, the, the play of dust in relation to modernity. I mean, think of right, uh, bourgeois, bourgeois literature, right? uh, bourgeois letters of the 19th century, and constantly cleaning the dust off the tabletops, right? uh, and so on and so forth, in order to make one's inhabitation unpolluted, and so on and so forth. And, and think of how it plays out today. So the, you know, the, the relation between dust, dust people, geographies of walking, pollution, polluted subjectivities, polluted socialities, and so on. Um, <clears throat> so, this relation between deception and the dissolution of subjecthood, suggested by Dick's notion of dust people, conjures a rethinking um, of race as modes of deception rather than as the theological creation of people and its evolution. Race can be conceived in terms rather of the sec secreting, secreting, um, playing again on, on secret as the, the, the making, the hiding of, and the secreting of, which always go together, right? I mean, think WikiLeaks, for example, right? uh, of identity in this doubled and ambiguous sense, as seeping into and molding personal, social, and political formation, but also conjuring, you might say, public secrets, even banalities of belonging, banishment, beleaguerment, belligerence, right? Uh, 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 in these terms. And, and what I'm suggesting is that the post racial is operating in something like this way. So the post-racial, then, is a mode of social magic, the alchemy of racism into non-racialism. It's etherealization, etherealization. Uh, the ghosts of racism's past dissolved into the indiscernible pixels making them up. Dust people, confined to memorialization on the History Channel, are variously disappeared, otherwise invisible and illegible, to the socially adoration of the government. So finally, and this will be the ending, I promise. Recourse to the post-racial holds at arm's length, thread of conceptual confusion, and just before I go on, 
Francis Aldis is a really interesting Belgian artist living for a very long time now in Mexico City. And um, he, he has a wonderful um, art piece, which is also a performance piece, called The Story of Deception. Um, <clears throat> looking. So recourse to the post-racial holds at arm's length the thread of conceptual confusion. Confusion, the conflating mixing of categories. <clears throat> that has come with the massive demographic movements of globalization and the associated stress of mixtures commercially and recreationally, aesthetically and culturally, conceptually and linguistically. Mixture mashups are now the objects of contemporary design. The post-racial is the refusal of the world's dissolving mixings, the fear of being confused, of uh, mixing one's metaphors, <coughs> of misstating because misreading who one is speaking to, for, or about, against. Call this following Alex Abramovich's discussion, a wonderful review of a wonderful book, uh, by a uh, novel by Percival, Percival uh, Everett. Uh, I am not Sidney Poitier, is the name of the novel. It's fantastic. I mean, you have to read it. It's, it's great. It's great. Um, so, uh, Alex Abramovich wrote in the London Review of Books a marvelous review um, called um, uh, Phenomenologically Fuck. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that we're in a state of being phenomenologically screwed. Right? Uh, uh, the fear of being phenomenologically fucked. The post-racial seeks to stave off the conditions of being conceptually confused. Is she, isn't she, of being phenomenolo phenomenologically, as I said, screwed. Far from being a thing of the past, racism has become reanimated as a key instrument of the political, only now in new ways and to new purpose. That the notion of race can be so easily filled with a new political purpose, alas, is basic to its chameleonic and politically uh, instrumental nature. The strategy of raciality is to extend suspicion to anything marked by its terms, effectively to erode the standing of those racially inscribed by innuendo or explicitation. So those long-standing, if subtly transmuting, racial orders invariably shadow the post-racial, delimiting its possibilities and constraining its reach. Structurally, post-raciality keeps in place prevailing conditions of historically produced racial arrangement of power, both domestically and globally, now stripped of their historically inherited terms of recognizability. Ideologically, post-racialism does not solely absolve whites of guilt for past racism, Rather, it erases the very histories producing the formations of racial power and privilege themselves, bearing them alive but out of recognizable reach, thus wiping away the very conditions out of which guilt could arise. Different strategy. Um, <clears throat> that denial of denial, no guilt because nothing recognizable to be guilty about. Thus, racialism is the uncanny feeling that there but for the good fortune of God's will go I. The uncanniness concerns the hint of misfortune while denying its possibility, or at least denying any responsibility for it structurally, causally, or morally. That I go there not suggests I've done something right, recognized in my earthly or heavenly reward. The force of sustained and sustaining historical subjection is reduced to the personalizing roulette of misfortune or bad decision making. I mean, that individualization that I started off with. Right? So there's an example that I'm. Um, uh, that I won't go through, which is Haley Barber in Mississippi, um, uh, right? Uh, making a museum out of the Museum Mississippi Trail, investing 20 million, even while he's, right, uh, giving uh, support to the White Citizens Council that were the famous kind of racist organization, right, that completely controlled political structure in Mississippi. And, you know, half his, half his population, I was going to say half his proletariat, that too. Um, right, are busy denying that you know mixed relationships are a, are a deep, perfectly decent thing, right? So I'll you know I, I I mean we're in this profoundly confused, this phenomenologically fucked moment, right? Where where these conditions of reversibility are, are all over the place. So you should go and look up low key, <laughs> right? Uh, called Obama Nation. Uh, the, the, so two versions of it. It's quite wonderful. He's a black rapper in. in um, yeah, I mean, these are some of them. Just uh, in. Um, in Britain. And uh, uh, has a critique both of 
of America, but also of, of Israel Palestine uh, in, in various videos. And it's it quite wonderful, actually, in the kind of um, <coughs> mashup that he engages both sonically and, uh, and images. Um, and uh, the other is a group called. The Anfurt is the Afrikaans word for um, uh, for the answer for, for the answer, um, sorry. and uh, they're a group, white group, uh, uh, in South Africa. They were actually interviewed on Letterman or something uh, called Enter the. Sorry, uh, you can look them up too. So the Antwoord entered the ninja, right? Uh, and uh, you know they're they're profoundly about conceptual confusion, um, so sort of racial conceptual confusion, right? So sort of really interesting to go and take a look at, um, uh, right? Uh, sort of uh, man. So um, yeah, that's it. Thanks.